It's Wednesday, July 6th. I'm Laura Kornfield, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. The U.S. State Department has accused Israel of systematically seizing Palestinian land and therefore undermining prospects for a two-state solution. The strongly worded statement made by U.S. State Department spokesman John Kirby yesterday was in response to Israel's approval earlier this week to construct hundreds of new housing units in Jerusalem and over the Green Line, as well as in an East Jerusalem Arab neighborhood. Speaking to reporters, Kirby said the U.S. opposes the steps, which are viewed as counterproductive to peace. We are deeply concerned about settlement construction and expansion in East Jerusalem and the West Bank and the designation of land throughout the West Bank for exclusive Israeli use. Israel's new housing plans were also condemned by the United Nations and European Union. Israel's announcement came after two horrific terror attacks days earlier in which 13-year-old Halel Yaffa Ariel and Rabbi Michael Mark were murdered. The U.S. Missile Defense Agency and Israel's Defense Ministry announced the completion of a test in recent days aimed at integrating Israeli and American air defense systems with one another. The trial run simulated thousands of missiles fired at Israel from Iran and Lebanon, testing the multi-layer defense systems. The trial was conducted in locations scattered in the U.S., Israel, and Europe and tested the physical connectivity between the systems, examining if Israel's aero system and David Sling was able to link up with the American defense systems. A statement issued by the defense ministry said dozens of Israeli and American personnel participated in the trial. Fierce clashes erupted between IDF forces and Palestinians before dawn this morning during a raid to arrest terror suspects in the Palestinian village of Dura, located in the Hebron area. At least 10 Palestinians were injured in the violence. IDF forces also operated in the Ramallah area, arresting four terror suspects. Meanwhile, yesterday afternoon, soldiers shot and wounded a Palestinian girl armed with a knife at a bus stop, not far from the city of Ariel in Judea and Samaria. Dramatic video footage captured by a passing motorist shows 17-year-old Jamila Jabbar approaching the soldiers with the knife raised over her head and the soldiers backing away with their weapons drawn. Jabbar continues to advance towards the soldiers when they open fire, hitting her in the abdomen. The assailant was taken to hospital in Israel in serious condition. Medical officials said her condition improved overnight. The trial of IDF soldier Elor Azaria who is accused of manslaughter for having shot dead a neutralized Palestinian terrorist in Hebron, continued today at the Jaffa Military Court. The hearings began with the testimony of Yariv Ben Ezra, the outgoing commander of the Yehuda Brigade, who testified that to the best of his memory, Azaria said that terrorists need to be killed when he fired at the assailant. The soldier's defense attorney lashed out at the witness, saying the commander did not speak to any of the soldiers at the scene and is basing his testimony on selective memory. Today's hearings follow an intensive day of deliberations on Tuesday when the soldier's father broke out in tears, charging that his son was not receiving a fair trial. The Palestinian Authority has reportedly decided to sever all ties with the Quartet, the United States, European Union, Russia, and the United Nations in response to a report released last week, which the Palestinians claim failed to blame Israel for settlement construction and the frozen peace process. This according to a report in the Arabic language daily, El Hayat, yesterday. However, a statement released by Palestinian Prime Minister Rami Hamdallah dismissed the claim, saying instead the Palestinian leadership had decided to stop cooperating with the Quartet. Hamdallah called the Quartet's report an imbalanced assessment of the realities on the ground, saying it equates between victim and colonizer while giving Israeli soldiers a pass, settlers a pass. The report cited Palestinian incitement against Israel as a major obstacle to ending the conflict and accused Hamas and Fatah of encouraging terror attacks. It criticized Israel's settlement building and the demolishing of Palestinian homes and confiscation of land. In the third stop of his tour of four sub-Saharan African countries, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu arrived in Rwanda today where he visited a memorial in the capital city, Kigali, 
dedicated to victims of the country's 1994 genocide. Later, he was set to meet with President Paul Kagame to discuss ways of deepening cooperation between the two countries. Later tonight, Netanyahu will fly to Ethiopia, the last leg of his visit, before returning to Israel on Friday. Police Commissioner Roni Sheikh appeared before the Knesset's Internal Affairs Committee today to discuss a recently released document which reportedly has incriminating evidence on suspected wrongdoing of nearly two dozen Knesset members. El Sheikh said that while the report is justified, the majority of information detailed in the document should be regarded as garbage. During today's session, the police commissioner was bombarded with questions from MKs regarding the report and its purpose. He insisted that the police needed to keep a record of complaints on Knesset members, even if it turned out that the claims were baseless or there was no wrongdoing. The prison's parole board has agreed to once again review former President Moshe Katsav's appeal for early release. The request to commute his sentence by a third for good behavior was transferred back to the prisoner's rehabilitation authority yesterday after the Lowe District Court decided to charge the authority with presenting a new evaluation regarding the former president's prospects for rehabilitation. Katsav is serving a seven-year jail term for rape and other sexual offenses. Since he began serving his prison term in 2011, Katsav has never expressed regret for his behavior, claiming he is innocent of all wrongdoing. The Environmental Protection Ministry has urged the public to keep away from beaches in the Haifa area after oil spilled from an old pipe that burst in the Haifa Bay area during an operation to remove such pipes from the seabed. The oil spilled over a radius of some 1,200 meters, threatening beaches in the Kiryat Chaim and Kiryat Yam area. The ship that caused the pipe to burst belongs to Petroleum and Energy Infrastructure Limited, who took responsibility for the incident and worked to prevent the estimated one to one and a half cubic meters of oil from spreading further. Rabbi Rick Jacobs, the head of the U.S. Reform Movement, led an egalitarian prayer service at the Western Wall Plaza this week and called on the government to implement the plan for a permanent egalitarian prayer plaza at the holy site. IBA's Elon Aslin Levy met Anat Hoffman from the Women of the Wall to discuss the issue in the first of a two-part series on religion and state in Israel. We're the catalysts that moved something very important, the liberation of the wall and the reminder to all Jews there is more than one way to be Jewish in Israel. The Western Wall is the epicenter of the struggle over Jewish identity today. Anad Hoffman is director of Women of the Wall, who seek to break the site's ultra-Orthodox monopoly, securing freedom of worship for women, including practices reserved in Orthodoxy for men. An important religious leader in this region was able to make a revolution with 12 followers. Women of the Wall, we are 13 on our board, and we are revolutionizing the Jewish world. Anat and her colleagues have been arrested multiple times at the Wall for reading out loud from a Torah scroll or wearing a talit. I don't think we are actively involved in civil disobedience. We are creatively reinterpreting a very uh, rigid system that needs a kick in the butt. When our legal advisor says, ladies, this is breaking the law, then we, I don't remember in our 27-year history that we willfully went and bro broke the law. We were arrested many times, but never charged. Their fight comes alongside another campaign to secure freedom of worship for Jews on the Temple Mount, also involving altercations with the police. Do the women of the wall see themselves as sisters in arms with the Temple Mount faithful? We have an argument with our brothers on the holiest side of the Jewish people. We're not involving the neighbors. That's a whole different thing. Right now, both Jewish men and Jewish women are forbidden from praying at the Temple Mount. When men are allowed to pray at the Temple Mount, Jewish men, then we'll argue about women's right. In January, the government approved a historic compromise, the creation of a permanent egalitarian plaza under Robinson's Arch, just south of the traditional Kotel. Some accuse women of the wall of surrendering to the ultra-Orthodox. We capitulated to a realistic uh, understanding and analysis of Israeli politics, of the time that has passed, and where the Israeli public is willing to go. And I think we reached a historic compromise. Is it the same wall? My holy Geiger counter says yes. Is it the one they're used to? No. 
it's a little out of the comfort zone. And that's the nature of a compromise. For the sake of peace, it's the rabbi himself that actually recruited the Jewish world to support women of the wall. By badgering every little girl to wear a shmate, enough is enough. He should have his plaza. He should run it as strong as he can. We should have ours, and we'll see where the nine million visitors go. The ultra-Orthodox rabbinate is strongly opposed to the compromise on the Western Wall. Do you see this plan as likely to happen in the end? I have faith that it will happen. Uh, sadly, the problem is the Prime Minister of Israel, who has given them the keys to the holiest side of the Jewish people. They're abusing this monopoly, and it's time to take the keys back. Many would argue that the reason that the cause of egalitarian prayer has failed to make headway in Israel is not because of the objections of the ultra-Orthodox, but the disinterest of secular Jews. I think Israelis have a lot of learned helplessness. And the reason that Israelis are not trying to counteract the uh, Orthodox monopoly is because they think they will fail. Diaspora Jewry is heavily invested in the cause of religious pluralism in Israel. Is it fair for them to make demands when they're not citizens of the state? Every Jew and Jewess around the planet has a duty to voice what they think are the Jewish values of the Jewish state. Are they ethnocentrism, racism, chauvinism, or are they pluralism, equality, and tolerance? And if you are not, it's, Zionism is not a spectator sport. If we call this country, Israel, a Jewish democratic state, then all Jews are part of it. If we want to call it just the Israeli state, uh, that's a whole different thing. Israel is way too important to be left to the Israelis. Workers from the Israel Broadcasting Authority's television and radio protested outside the finance ministry this morning over the plans of the new public broadcasting corporation to transfer operations out of Jerusalem to Modi'in. Workers also expressed outrage over the failure of the new corporation to incorporate a large majority of the current IBA employees. In a display of solidarity, a number of Knesset members joined the protesters. M.K. Lan Gilon of the Meretz Party said that while he represents a small party in the Knesset, he will do everything in his power to alter the decision. Lawmaker R.L. Margalit of the Zionist Union echoed similar sentiments. As for the future of the English newscast in particular, it remains unclear at this point whether the new corporation plans to continue broadcasting English news at all. Zionist Union M.K. Chilik Bar told IBA News that while he was not aware of plans to stop the English broadcast at the end of September, when the current authority is slated to shut down, he would act to ensure it remains in the new corporation. I think that it's a, it will be a disgrace. It will be an evil that we cannot uh, allow. I think that the government loves to praise Jerusalem and say how, how important is Jerusalem and how we love it forever and ever. But on the field, de facto, we are making moves that will hurt Jerusalem. Uh, the uh, broadcast uh, authority is a symbol, and Jerusalem is a symbol. We have to take a decision that all the main institutions and bodies, the important one, the national one of Israel, will be in Jerusalem. And about plans to shut down the English news that serves abroad as well as here? And I think that this is definitely something we shouldn't do. I didn't even hear about it, but this is a total stupidity. And if it's really something that they are planning, I'm calling them to... Uh, to, uh, to, this, to um, uh, cancel this decision and definitely even uh, give great support to the English uh, and Arabic versions of, of the news. Veteran Israel television journalist Yaakov Achimer will be presented a Lifetime Achievement Award by B'nai B'rith at a special ceremony tomorrow in Jerusalem, recognizing excellence in coverage of diaspora affairs. In the midst of a five-decade career, Achimer continues to cover Jewish communities around the world in his acclaimed weekly news and culture program, Roim Olam seeing the world. Achimeir spoke to IBA's Efrat Batat about the state of relations between Israel and the diaspora as seen through a journalist's eye. My impression is that the relations between uh, the people who live in Israel, between the Israelis and the Jews around the world are not very, are, are very uneasy now. I think the relations are quite, uh, I don't know, maybe you define it as a some kind of uh, uh, feeling of indifference to uh, what is happening in Israel and what is happening in Israel and outside Israel we all know what is going on. This is because the young generation, this is my impression, I didn't conduct a 
a survey about it, but this is my personal in, in, uh, impression, that the younger generation, the younger Jewish de generation, especially in the American continent, in the United States, they don't care much about Israel. They are interested in uh, many important other issues like the environment, domestic politics in the United States, and so on. And I think that uh, the Israeli government, uh, especially Mr. Netanyahu, who knows something about uh, the United States, should uh, take more steps in order to strengthen the relations between Israel, the people in Israel, and the Jews outside uh, Israel. And you say this despite the fact that this year saw a significant rise in Aliyah, in immigration to Israel. We're seeing more programs of Taglit, of, of bringing people to Israel. You still think this is the case? I still think that this is the case, especially among the students' communities around the, in the universities of uh, the United States. And we saw it in some uh, documentaries which proved that uh, the young generation, as I said before, does not express warm or care about what is happening in Israel. What are some of the areas that need most work on, that we need to strengthen? First of all, we have to report about the non-Orthodox uh, streams in, in, among the Jews in the United States. We have to show more understanding to the reform movement in the United States. My niece is a reform rabbi in uh, Jerusalem, and I think that she is more Jewish than many other so-called formal Jews. About the conservative uh, uh, segment in the American uh, Jewry, we have to know about it. We have to understand that there are other not other kinds of Judaism, but other aspect of uh, Judaism in the United States. And we don't know about it. We, we know about disputes, we know about controversy about the Western world, and so on and so forth. But we don't go deep into the issues. So, Yaakov, how would you describe the role of journalism in portraying Israel's image abroad? The mission of a journalist to report the truth, what he sees, what is happening. And I'm not trying to improve the image of Israel. It's not my job to improve the image of uh, Israel. I consider myself an Israeli patriot, but it's not my job, it's not my mission, it's not my task to improve the mission, the, the, the image of Israel. I like Israel very much. But having such a platform, do you sometimes feel that you are an ambassador and not just a journalist? No, I don't feel that I'm an ambassador. I'm very happy, of course, when I um, uh, encounter some uh, positive uh, aspects of uh, Israel in other countries. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an educator. I'm not an instructor. After all your years in journalism, is there one memorable event? Uh, one moment is uh, a very obvious one. Uh, in 1977, I, uh, I believe that some of the viewers will remember the arrival of uh, uh, Sadat, the uh, Egyptian president, uh, to Israel. There was, at the time, there was only one television channel in Israel, and I was, to go th together with my colleagues, technicians, journalists, reporters, but I represented, I, 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 I hesitate whether to say it or not, but I was the representative from a journalistic point of view of Israel in, near the tarmac, in the, in the airport. And of course, it was a very moving uh, moment. I don't have to do much uh, explanations about it. And on my way to the airport, I passed through near the King David Hotel, and suddenly, I noticed that on the top, on the roof of the King David Hotel, there were Egyptian flags. I mean, a, the young generation cannot understand what did it mean to Israel only a few years after the Yom Kippur War, that an Egyptian president came, uh, landed at Ben Gurion Airport. 
and turning to the United States were just hours after the FBI announced that no charges would be brought against Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton over her use of private email servers. U.S. President Barack Obama joined her on stage for the first time at a campaign rally. After offering Clinton a ride on Air Force One, Obama sought to drum up support for the Democratic presidential candidate. Earlier FBI Director James Comey said he would not recommend filing charges against Clinton, but rebuked her for being extremely careless in the handling of classified information. Everybody's got an opinion, but nobody actually knows the job until you're sitting behind the desk. Everybody can tweet, but nobody actually knows what it takes to do the job until you sat behind the desk. I mean, Sasha tweets, but she doesn't think that she's thereby should be sitting behind the desk. So you can't fully understand what it means to make life and death decisions until you've done it. That's the truth. But I can tell you this. Hillary Clinton has been tested. She has seen up close what's involved in making those decisions. She has participated in the meetings in which those decisions have been made. She's seen the consequences of things working well and things not working well. And there has never been any man or woman more qualified for this office than Hillary Clinton. I, I feel very privileged because I've known the president in many roles as a colleague in the Senate, as an opponent in a hard-fought primary, and, and the president I was so proud to serve as Secretary of State. But I've also known him as the friend that I was honored to stand with in the good times and the hard times. Someone who has never forgotten where he came from. And Donald, if you're out there tweeting, it's Hawaii. For his part, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump wasted no time harshly criticizing the outcome of the FBI investigation. Trump accused Today Clinton of bribing the attorney general for favorable treatment in the emails case and claim the results prove the system is totally rigged. At the same time, the Republican presidential hopeful slammed Clinton's appearance with President Obama. He sent vast amounts of classified information, including information classified as top secret. Top secret, okay? And this is where they said that she was extremely careless. And frankly, I say, grossly incompetent. She will be such a lousy president, folks. So sad. Okay. The lives of the American people were put at risk by Hillary Clinton so that she could carry on her corrupt financial dealings. NASA, the U.S. Space Agency, announced that the Juno spacecraft capped a five-year journey to Jupiter after it looped into orbit to probe the origins of the biggest planet on the solar system. Jupiter's immense gravity also helps to divert asteroids and comets from any collisions with Earth and the rest of the inner solar system. Launched five years ago in Florida, Juno had to be precisely positioned in order to prevent it from sailing past Jupiter, making it impossible to complete the $1 billion mission. NASA experts expect Juno to be in position on August 27th to take its first close-up images. Back here at home, the annual Fringe Festival in Beersheba kicked off last night. For three consecutive nights, the Desert Town hosts a variety of special events aimed at the entire family. 
69 performances featuring 240 artists are on the agenda. The lineup includes Fringe Theater, Fringe Dance, Fringe Kids and Art, and even Global Fringe with a taste of international performances. You still have today and tomorrow to make your way to the Negev for this exciting festival. Local Money Matters shares were down in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange while the shekel was mixed in foreign currency trading. Here are the numbers. change in temperatures tomorrow, but on Friday we should see a slight drop near the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. And that's all for this newscast. Please join us again tomorrow, same time, same channel. I'm Laura Cornfield, wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.